urban agriculture is something I'm not really too familiar with. So I'm really excited uh, to have so many great presenters here tonight. Um, I was really excited to, to see the Botanic Garden. Uh, when I heard about the rooftop on McCormick Place where they're farming on there, I thought that was the coolest thing I've ever heard of. So I'm really excited to, to have Angela here. Um, Growing Home is a fantastic program helping um, ex-offenders and uh, the homeless learn job skills uh, so they can uh, you know, improve their lives. And then uh, Urban Till with uh, an amazing program. Uh, I was actually just talking with Brock and I said that I went somewhere that uh, had Urban Till greens and it was fantastic. And then he kind of wasn't sure if uh, that's, uh, if they actually have Urban Till, so maybe it's like faux Urban Till greens, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but apparently if that's the case, then the name is big enough that someone wants to, to kind of claim it. So I'm really excited to have you here and I'm really excited to learn from these fantastic speakers. So I'm gonna turn it over to Mark and he's gonna uh, get us started. Yeah, I'm just gonna um, do a quick introduction to the speakers. Um, I graduated from the program in I think about a year and a half ago. Um, and I had the pleasure of kind of uh, recruiting these speakers um, here today. Um, I used to actually work with Angela at Windy City Harvest. Um, and uh, it's a very tight-knit community, the urban ag scene. So I'm, I'm very excited to have all of these presenters here today. Um, I'd like to introduce Angela Mason, who's um, been with the Chicago Botanic Garden for the past 11 years. Um, working for the, uh, managing the Windy City Harvest Program. Um, I'm going to pull up my notes here too. Prior to that, she was, uh, um, let's see, Angela, what is your background? Uh, she, um, she's a certified nation, uh, National Foundation for Teaching Young Entrepreneurs instructor. She uh, served as an adjunct faculty member at the Harold Washington College. She's been an honored, um, been honored at the, at the Environmental Hero by the Lieutenant Governor of Illinois, and she graduated from um, Southern Illinois University with a BS in Plant and Soil Science. So without further ado, I give you Angela Mason. So I thought I'd start first with a great uh, shot of the, the farm that we have the best uh, view of the skyline at. And uh, this is McCormick Place, and it really is um, a stunning view from the rooftop there. Um, and I'll talk more about our farm sites and, and what we do in just a moment. But I want to give you a little bit of history about how I got started in urban agriculture and kind of where I'm coming from and what, how I, I got here. Uh, so back in 2003, I was still working on my master's degree, and um, at the time I was studying landscape design, and my undergrad is in landscape design. With the thought of going after I finished my master's in plant soil and general ag, I would go and get a master's in landscape architecture later on down the road. Knowing that I wanted to do like interpretation and work for a botanic garden and really get people interested in horticulture as a whole, I, I started looking at, at botanic gardens and different jobs that were available. So um, the job that was available at the botanic garden was a coordinator of school and community gardening. I thought, okay, I'll apply. I have no idea what this means, but I'll apply. And um, during the interview, they said, okay, I see you have an agriculture background. Have you grown vegetables? And I said, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, on my back porch, you know, everywhere. My grandpa was a kid, you know, no problem. And they said, well, what about starting a farm with teenagers? And I said, yeah, sure. And in the back of my head, I'm going, oh my God, this is the worst <laughs> thing ever. <laughs> and I kept thinking, no big deal, it just, you can transfer to display gardens. This is all in my head. <laughs> and I hadn't even been offered a position yet, but I had already gone past that point. And so uh, about a, uh, two weeks later, they called and said, well, we'd like to offer you the position. I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> I really have to do this now. <laughs> and um, so I, I took the position, and um, 
what it ended up being was actually very literally, and this is in 2003, um, starting with a one acre farm that hadn't been, it was a one acre plot of land in the middle of a forest preserve and 13 teenagers. And we still had prairie grass that was like this tall and we didn't have fencing, we didn't have, I mean it was a blank slate. It's like, all right, we can, we can work with this. I was like, where's the roundup? <laughs> and they're like, oh, no, no, we, no, you're growing organically. I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> I said, okay, we can do this. <laughs> so um, all that being said, um, all of the programs that we're involved in now are incredibly um, life-changing for everyone involved. And I don't mean that for just our, our transitional jobs program or just our youth program or just our apprenticeship program. I mean that for everybody in, involved. Um, I, it's been over 12 years now and I don't even look back to what it would look like if I went and got my MLA and was a designer for, you know, whatever. I don't, I don't even look back to that now. I just, um, it was something that really just watching and learning with the kids and having that experience was really, really, I mean, life changing in so many ways. So. I'm happy to be here today to share with you everything that I learned over that time and, and kind of where we are and what we're doing now. So we started, like I said, in 2003 with that one site and 13 teenagers. So uh, now today, um, this is the youth farm program that I, start, uh, that I was talking about that we kind of started with. And it used to be called Green Youth Farm and we just went through this big branding uh, exercise and changed everything to Windy City Harvest. So um, I'm going to start from the top though um, and I'll go through each of these in more detail. Um, but we have a core program that we work with um, ex-offenders specifically from Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice. We have our apprenticeship program that works with adults and then we have the youth farm program that got me started in all of this. So. The goal with all of the programs is to get them to the point where they're entering our per professional certificate program and then on to either further education jobs or starting their own bar <coughs> businesses. We have um, 12 sites now across the city. We just uh, signed an agreement to do a, our 12th site just this morning. Um, and we are spread um, all the way up in North Chicago, clear down to our site that's furthest south is in Washington Park. Um, all of the red dots that you see are where we distribute produce. Um, and much of our produce goes to the Women, Infant, and Children's Centers through uh, the WIC program and, and produce boxes and that's our main source of distribution for uh, produce. So our Windy City Harvest Corps program, or Harvest Corps is what I'll keep calling it, uh, is our transitional jobs program. We just started working with Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice this year, and we work to, um, we aim to work with 17 to 21 year old ex-offenders. Most of them, it's their first offense, um, and they're coming to us without any job experience and without any idea of what having a job or keeping a job looks like. Um, our placement rate is 45% um, of our graduates uh, retain their employment for over 90 days and our goal again is to get them into our apprenticeship program. This is um, our rodeo farm. We're in the parking lot of the rodeo, the old parking lot of the rodeo so we've um, kind of just, it's stuck. Um, but this is one of our transitional um, job sites. We also use this as a learning lab for the apprenticeship program. So our apprenticeship program continues to grow. Um, it started out as uh, just the nine month certificate program. And we work to have one third ex-offenders, one third that are workforce investment act eligible or have barriers to employment, low income, underemployed, unemployed, that sort of thing and then one third who pay full tuition. And we do this in partnership with city colleges. We're housed at um, Arturo Velasquez Institute. It's a 
satellite campus of Daly College. Um, so that's how we started out. And um, since then, we've grown a little bit. We've added a couple of 14 week industry specific certificates. Um, this year, we're doing season extension, aquaponics, and then uh, business and entrepreneurship for local foods. We'll be adding uh, others in the next uh, couple of years. And uh, just this year, we started um, a farmer incubator program. And the site in this picture is the incubator farm. And that's in the old Robert Taylor homes at, Legends, um, at the Legends South community. And this is a bigger picture of that farm site. So our goal here is to house um, up to six farm businesses a year on this site. Um, we also have a production farm on site for our own um, distribution. And we have a farmer mentor, shared tool use, um, shared distribution for produce. And um, this is a uh, the first real year for production at that site. We also have um, another goal of this site is uh, we have a community garden adjacent to um, this farm that we work with residents of Legend South uh, with the goal of enrolling them eventually in the nine month certificate program and then through the incubator program and hopefully here at Legends. And then with the youth farm, um, this is the thing that got us all started in this. Um, we have four locations. The first one, the, the, the kind of heart and soul of Youth Farm is um, in Lake County and on the border of North Chicago and Waukegan. Another little story, just to backtrack a little bit. So that first year, we put our first crops in the ground um, the week of 4th of July. I took all 13 kids to a conference that weekend um, and came back and um, everything had been leveled because we didn't have our deer fence in yet. We were, that was getting installed while I took the kids to the conference. So when I say heart and soul, there's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears that went into that site. Um, the, that, the Lake County site, we work with about 30 teenagers at, um, per year, North Lawndale, between 15 and 20. Uh, Washington Park about 20 and then Urban Garden Lab is a new site and that's at the After School Matters headquarters um, downtown on Randolph. Uh, that one we do all aquaponics, uh, hydroponics and then we have a rooftop garden there. We work with between 90 and 100 teenagers a year. Um, we focus on, I put the A in STEM careers because it should be, um, it should include agriculture and art. Um, so I'm changing it to STEAM careers, not STEM. Uh, civic engagement is a big part of what they do. Youth development, we focus on social emotional learning and creating a safe space. That's our biggest, one of our biggest goals is creating a space where the teens feel like they can um, come and be themselves. And so um, since this is a sustainability group, I figured I would talk about some of the sustainability things that we focus on. And, um, and I'll go off topic a little bit and talk about what some of the, the Botanic Garden uh, sustainability issues are. Um, but first, one of the core pieces of what we do with all three of the components of Windy City Harvest is we use the Roots of Success curriculum. And it's, um, it creates a common language of eco-literacy um, through the lens of social justice for all of our participants. And just gives a really good understanding of what, um, what other green jobs and green career paths there are for the youth and uh, young adults. All of our markets, um, I mentioned that we did the WIC baskets. That, um, that's different from our, our markets and our other distribution. Um, they're all less than three miles from each of our farm sites and we focus on keeping our farm stands and farmers markets in the communities that the farms are in. Uh, we use soil blocks, we don't use pots, uh, so all of our starts are done in soil blocks and we, um, we 
don't have a lot of waste then um, with little pots everywhere. Um, we're starting starts for eight acres of farm sites. So um, it's at least 40,000 starts a year. And then we really focus on using reusable packaging for our distribution. Um, we used to use wax boxes. They are not only expensive, but they're not reusable for uh, food safety reasons. And uh, so we really started looking at ways that we could reduce our impact on um, the environment with using reusable packaging. So we have collapsible containers that we uh, package all of our produce in. and. Um, you know, those then go to our distributor that we work with, and then they send them back to us to fill up uh, again. And the 4,500 wax boxes a year, that's, um, that's an estimate. I'm, it's probably higher than the 4,500 boxes a year. Uh, we have a, a demo system now. We had a much larger aquaponics system, but um, we lost that space. Um, so we have a small demo aquaponics system now. We're working to um, have access to a warehouse to do a much larger commercial system for training for um, the certificate program that we're developing. And that's just a really good example for water conservation. And then we have a composting operation where we divert about 24 tons of food scraps a year. Um, and that's what we do through the farm programs. The Botanic Garden as a whole uh, started um, a corporate roundtable on sustainability uh, three years ago, I want to say. And they host um, different, uh, different corporations. Um, I think there's 30 corporations now that are members of this roundtable. And they come quarterly to the garden to meet and talk about things like um, electric charging stations for cars, and they talk about um, changing to LED lights instead of um, T5 fluorescents or whatever. Um, and uh, through that program, the garden now has uh, charging stations for electric cars. Um, they've changed the cafeteria <coughs> to um, using all china and um, materials that can be washed instead of throwing away. Um, they're, they just put all of the automatic flush things on toilets. They're putting in the, the drinking fountains where you can fill up water bottles. Um, they don't sell bottled water at the garden anymore. So those are all kinds of things that have come out of this um, corporate round table. And I think it's um, something that fits with what we're doing with um, the farm programs in addition to some of the things that um, the garden's looking at doing too. Uh, so what's next? Um, we're looking at developing three more uh, certificates, one of them on rooftop farming and edible landscaping, uh, value-added products and cottage foods, and then mid to large scale composting. These last two, um, we're waiting on some different city regulations to go through before we put too much time and energy into those. Um, but the idea is between um, the business class and season extension and value added products, the idea is that our incub incubator farmers then can learn how to make half an acre quarter of an acre, something that is economically um, viable and an opportunity then to earn not a full um, living, but at least subsidize their um, existing incomes or you know, with a half acre or more, it starts to become more of something that they can do as, their, their, as a living. Uh, we're also looking at um, one of the things that came out of the incubator farm was Looking at, um, you know, we have kind of a buying collective now, but either expanding on that or helping the farmers develop a co op or um, even looking at a food hub for the incubator farmers. So, those are things that we're exploring now for um, the incubator farmers. And then just continuing to work to train the next generation of farmers and having a professional way that people can, can do that. Um, 
And I'm just going to end with um, some of our statistics. And uh, this is since the beginning of the, the programs. I, I mentioned the WIC boxes. All of our other distribution is listed here. Um, we work really closely with Midwest Foods, um, not only as a distributor, but as an employment partner. Um, Saver McCormick Place has been incredible to work with with the rooftop farm. They use all of the product that um, we grow on the rooftop in their food service um, within McCormick Place. Um, Hilton Conrad has been wonderful to, to work with. They're the primary um, recipient of produce from Midwest Foods. And um, then we have like Edible Alchemy, for example, is a graduate of Windy City Harvest and went off and started um, a, a co-op. So those are some of the things that some of our graduates have done. So um, questions now or at the very end? Questions now. Okay, questions now. So if anybody has questions, yes. Could you go into more detail on the composting program as it's currently <coughs> executed or has been? I, I understand there's all kinds of uh, yeah. things around that and whatever, but um, I just want to know how you do it, what you do, where is it done, Okay. Done with it. Yeah. Well, that's how Mark started with us. <laughs> um, we have, we, we have about an acre that we use for our composting operation. Um, we, we have food scraps that we collect from Midwest Foods and use that in our a windrow system. We have a bobcat that has a, an aerator attached to it, so we're able to turn the windrows on a very regular basis. And um, it's all done, um, you know, as one of the transitional jobs. So we employ about five, of, um, five crew members and a crew leader uh, to maintain and operate that operation. Where are you collecting from? Uh, just from Midwest Foods right now, because we can't really, I mean. Is it a I'm sorry, is it a grocery store distributor? The distributor that we sell to, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, as soon as we figure out what the regulations are, <laughs> well, that, that will kind of determine what we can do and legally for a composting operation. Um, I'd like to be able to collect from restaurants and be able to have people drop off and all of that, but we, we have to wait and, and see. There are a lot of regulations behind compost operations. So. Into our lot of our city lots, the cookies, the drones, and the are really mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and that's a, that's a really good point. Um, it's most, so all of the city locations that uh, we grow in, um, we, we use a, a barrier and bring compost in and grow up from there. Um, the only site that we grow in ground in is the site in Waukegan because it's clean. It's one of the cleanest soils that um, I've seen since being in Chicago. Um, so. Uh, we've experimented with a lot of different ways of, um, like, for instance, oh, you can't really see the raised beds. So in this site, um, this site is probably the best example that we have of how to do it in a more economically um, viable way, because it can be very expensive to remediate a site. Um, we put down a geotextile barrier and brought compost in. And instead of doing raised beds for each bed, we did one giant tub of soil with, um, with these larger timbers. Um, most of our sites were only growing in about 10 to 12 inches of soil. Uh, and it's, it's all compost that we've, we've brought in. And that, that's expensive, and that's why the compost regulations need to change, so that we can compost on site and, and be able to create our own um, growing media. But that's one of our biggest um, barriers to expanding is, is the cost of compost. So. Um, I guess this is related to the last question. What are some of the um, biggest challenges your young farmers have as they go out on their own? That is the ultimate goal that they, you know, they're like, um, Yeah. What are some of the, what are the obstacles in getting started if you are 
are somebody who has received these bills and uh, is able to do that. Are, are there any concerns? Are there any common problems among them that have arisen that you've that you noticed or things we're knowing about? Yeah. Uh, one of the big issues is um, getting a business license. There isn't a business license for urban agriculture, so all of the farmers um, are looking at what kind of business license they can apply for, and the one that is easiest and most straightforward and applies most directly to urban farming in the eyes of the city is a, a peddler's license. Um, so that, um, that presents challenges. Um, <laughs> The other thing is uh, finding liability insurance. When you call an insurance company and start talking about um, insurance for a farm, and then they start like, you know, farming is dangerous, farming is, and they, they go through all of these steps in their head and they're like, how big is this farm? And we're like, oh, a quarter of an acre. Oh God, I don't even know where to start for that. So insurance is, is another thing. Um, and finding an insurance company that can deal with a small space because they're always thinking of conventional farms when they're talking, when, when they think about farms. Um, I think another really, the biggest issue um, and kind of the gorilla in the room is, is access to land. Um, we're working with other, I mean, the Legend South Farm is, uh, Brinshore Michaels is the developer and they were interested in having us on site as, as a farm and we created their incubator farm that way. Um, but it's a two acre space. We've graduated 89 people. We have so many more coming down through, through the program now. You know, at the end, we can only serve six farmers a year on the incubator space and where are they gonna go when they're done with us? You know, it's, it's land access is a big issue. So um, we're, we're working with a number of different people to figure out a solution to, to that problem. Um, but those are the three main issues. So my question is, uh, you're talking about like land being available, and I know you involved in some rooftop uh, mm -hmm. uh, farms, and I was wondering if there's anything like vastly different you run into with a roof <laughs> Yeah, so um, with McCormick Place, we were fortunate they already had an existing green roof, and we transitioned it into a roof that was sedum, um, mostly sedum, uh, and some other natives, or some natives, not other natives, sedum isn't a native. Um, we, we worked with the structural engineer to determine how much soil or compost we could add to the existing media, um, which can be a challenge. I mean, we are really very literally growing in four to six inches of soil on the rooftop. Um, so depending on the stu structural integrity of the building, um, weight is an issue. Um, the thing, though, that almost kept us from being able to turn that into a farm was insurance and liability. Um, the insurance company was very weary of insuring us uh, to be on a rooftop. So um, that's a, a challenge. Um, I think those are the, the three main challenges. And figuring out how to farm in soil that's that shallow, I and mean, we're still growing tomatoes and peppers and eggplant and um, kale, Swiss chard, lettuces. I mean, we grow as, we tiny little baby atlas carrots, um, turnips, beets, you know, we, you name it. We've tried it up there. And the crops that I've just named are the crops that we stuck with. We haven't grown cucumbers or pumpkins or squash or any of that. Um, so it presents a challenge just in terms of soil depth and what you can get away with um, for, for crops. But if you can find an overbuilt building that can withstand, you know, we visited Kelly is here too. She and I visited a couple of rooftop farms in um, New York that they had a foot of soil. It's like, oh my God, <laughs> I would die for that. <laughs> so um, you, can, you can find buildings like that that are older and overbuilt and can hold that kind of weight. But it's important to make sure that um, the building can, can hold it. 
and work with a structural engineer, get it in writing. <laughs> and I think, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, we actually have a building that we're working on getting um, on the west side, um, and uh, part of part of um, one of our challenges is the the Botanic Garden doesn't own any land, even the land that the 360 some odd acres of garden up at the the main campus in Glencoe. We we don't own that. Everything is a lease or licensee agreement or the, the um, city's program, you have to be a landowner within two or three blocks of the space and you have to be willing to purchase the, the lot for a dollar. And we don't own any land. So that's a challenge for us. It's not a challenge for the incubator farmers if they live in the communities. So we do have um, in the business class now one young woman who um, she is actually in the process of purchasing one of the dollar lots. So we, we hope that that is one of the solutions to, um, but then, then you deal with um, zoning and uh, the issues around zoning. So there are, there are a few challenges that all of the farmers will have to overcome. And we're helping with that as much as we can. Yeah. Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, but um, we'll have more time for questions at the end. Um, thank you, Angela. Um, next up, we have Stephanie Douglas um, from Growing Home. Um, Stephanie um, is an organic farmer, performer, writer, and trainer. She is currently the farm enterprise director for Growing Home where she has been managing a 10-acre rural farm and training Chicagoans with barriers to employment. Um, when she is not in the field, she co-hosts This Much Is True, tells stories on stage all over Chicago, and develops sustainability programming for rural women in Uganda. So without further ado, I welcome Stephanie. problem. I'm going to take you on a, a tour of Windy City Harvest before we get to growing home. Um, first off, I just want to say thank you guys so much for giving me an excuse tonight to wear clothes that I can't wipe my hands on. Um, I really appreciate that. Uh, so let me just go back to the beginning. Um, I am uh, newly the farm enterprise director for Growing Home. So uh, I have been the manager of our 10-acre rural farm, and our urban farm manager, who manages all the city sites, uh, got into graduate school. And so I am transitioning into the city. Um, and that's just a little bit about me, but I'll go more into that later. First, I want to tell you about Growing Home. Uh, so Growing Home was actually technically founded in 1992 out of Coalition for the Homeless. Um, so we're a social enterprise, we provide transitional jobs and community development, and that is the last thing I'm going to read off of a slide. Uh, so in general, our mission is to use organic agriculture as job training in community development. And so Les Brown started growing home out of Coalition for the Homeless um, because he was working with people who did not have homes and he thought about like the idea that without homes you don't have roots. And it was the 90s, and we were very bad at metaphorical language. So he was like, how about we start a farm? Because they're literal roots. So he actually uh, got land from the US government through the McKinney Act. Um, is, there, is anyone familiar with the McKinney Act at all? Uh, so what the McKinney Act is is basically if the government has land that no government office wants to use, uh, what they say is, great, uh, if you want to use this for a good purpose, namely for in some capacity uh, helping those without homes or those in need, 
you can have this land for free for 30 years as long as you don't do anything evil on it. So if you steward it appropriately, you use it to serve the homeless, uh, the land is yours, and at the end of 30 years, you get it, um, no strings attached. So what Growing Home did was we actually got land in Marseilles, Illinois, which is a lovely town of about 4,500 people and 22 teeth. And so uh, we, we kept that land, and actually we would bring a lot of the people who we worked with out to that land to farm originally, because in the 90s, it was really hard to get land in the city. Um, and eventually, it actually took us until 2006 to get uh, Chicago to say, OK, here's a piece of land you can farm in the city. And most of the people we work with are actually in Chicago. In fact, pretty much exclusively. Um, we've had some people who have moved out to the suburbs at different times. But for the most part, we train Chicagoans with barriers to employment. Um, this is actually a shot of our Wood Street urban farm. So right now, we are operating three different farms. Uh, one is on the block of 58th and Wood in Englewood. Another one is actually catty corner to that, so it's like 59th and Honore. Um, and then there is the rural farm. Um, and the rural farm is about 10 acres, and our urban farms total about one and a half acres, but only about one is in production right now. Um, I feel like I keep skipping slides because I'm terrible at technology, but I'm OK at fixing tractors. All right. Um, <laughs> So this is a, a quote by Les Brown, who was our founder. Uh, so Growing Home actually started doing, I'm doing something amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Look at that. I can't make it go back, though. OK. Um, so we have our employment training program, which is mainly what we do. And we, we run things in two parts. Because we actually, unlike Windy City Harvest, trains the future of farmers, which is amazing. We actually, most of the people we train are not intending to become farmers and do not become farmers. What we do is we actually use organic agriculture as a means of job training, right? So that means that we create all kinds of curriculum and work that are transferable skills. So the idea is like even something like, well, you have to get up at 6 AM to get out to the rural farm. That's something that we can advocate to employer. Hey, this person was up at 6 AM, never late, had a really early wake up. Um, anything like uh, when you're farming, there are days on harvest days, you're doing a lot of different things, right? So this person is easily able to switch from one task to another with like very solid transitioning. Um, or this person is able to do something for hours and hours on end that seems like it has no end and still actually maintain like themselves in a positive attitude. So a lot of these things we use, again, as transferable skills and not to say, uh, hey, go out and start your own farm. That said, the, the fields that we usually place people in are um, mostly involving food. Food service, landscaping are our two main tracks. We also have customer service. We actually have one woman now who, like, I, don't, I couldn't even understand when she came in how she said she hasn't had a job in about 10 years. And it's like she has this gift of customer service. Like As soon as she was at the market, it was like everybody just wanted to be near her. And I'm like, this is amazing. So, a lot of times, we, we start ahead of the game with skills that people don't even realize that they have when they come to us. Um, this is a close-up of chard, because I wanted to make you all hungry for something raw. <laughs> all right. Um, so we talk about barriers to employment. And the main barriers to employment when Growing Home started, oh, I did it again. When Growing Home started, uh, one of the things we did was start out of Coalition for the Homeless. So obviously, we were serving people mainly without homes. Uh, as we became better at our jobs and realized more about the needs of Chicago, a large amount of our population, we actually transitioned. And now a majority, about 75% of the people we work with, um, their main barrier to employment is, in, is former incarceration. So, and there's also, so there's still homelessness, and there's also substance abuse and addiction. And in some cases, there are some combination of two of the three or all three. But I would say that a, a majority of the people we work with have been formerly incarcerated. Um, so we train 40 people every year, and we do that in two cohorts. So there's a 14-week cohort of 20 people, and then they graduate, and a 14-week cohort of 20 people. Uh, we're looking in the next about five years to double that, but we're going to double that slowly because we like to have really well-trained staff who know what they're doing and not suddenly hire a bunch of new people and be like, here are 40 additional people. Um, and so the, most of the people we work with uh, graduate, but actually a number of people in the last two years, because we have an amazing employment specialist, 
have actually been getting jobs before they complete our program. So last year, uh, and this is crazy, and I always hesitate to say this out loud because I feel like it jinxes things. Last year, our job placement rate for full-time jobs uh, with benefits was 93%. Um, yeah, and I was just like, this is great. Let's never expect this again because that's insane. Uh, but this year already, we're, we're uh, about three weeks from the end of our second cohort, and I think we're at like 87.5%. So we actually uh, may be approaching that again. Um, and, and to me, like these things, you know, it's not necessarily about that number, but it is about our people in jobs that they're very successful at. And what we try and do is not just say like, OK, great, you know, you did wonderfully. Go out and apply for that job. Have fun. See you. Uh, no, we are like leeches. Like we have people from you know five years ago who went through the program who, if something happens, know that they come back and we're like calling and and we actually don't have that contractually, although we're we're in some ways trying to get that to be part of our contract because then it really holds us accountable to that. Um, but uh, but most of our people we actually try and form relationships with employers. So most recently we formed a pretty strong relationship with Eastman Egg Company, who hired nine of our trainees. Uh, so go out and eat so many eggs because these people are awesome human beings and they make delicious food. Uh, and so we try and really, that way the employers like know exactly who they're getting. We can explain like different uh, issues or strengths that the people we place have. And also that while well, the employers, ideally, right, as people go off on their own, the employers form relationships with them and they go back and forth. But if there is an issue, if there is a slide back, there's one more person to advocate. Or there's one more person to like, to help one of our trainees actually go and you know find an anger management course that works. And it's not like your employer telling you you have to do this. It's somebody you have a relationship with. Um, so we're, it's, we're pretty big on relationships uh, with everybody. Um, this is another fun quote uh, from Lisa, plants are like people. So that, I don't know how I keep doing this, but I'm really, I think I'm doing it with my mind, actually. Uh, this is inside of our urban farm. So at Wood Street. Um, I'm just going to let it go and see what happens. We're going we're gonna to go nuts. Uh, so that was a picture of our urban farm at Wood Street. And um, we built this building when we thought we were probably going to be training about 25 people a year. So it looks like a really cool building, and it's a nightmare. Like it was, it was one of those things where like an architecture company was like, what? everything's going to be open spaces, and now we have like 49 people in there, and nobody wants to be in an open space because we're in open spaces outside all day. Somebody wants an office. Um, so this is actually a shot of what Wood Street looked like when we first got there, June 2006. So it was an empty lot. And then, and here's a shot. I don't know why uh, we took this shot in fall and decided to use it when everything looks a little depressing. But, uh, but you know, even fall is kind of beautiful there. So we have three hoop houses on that site. On our honorary site, we have uh, two much larger ones as well. And this farm did, I think, about nearly uh, 16,000 pounds of produce last year. Our rural farm did about 30,000 pounds of produce last year. So I'm going to pause for a moment and just tell you a little bit about the rural farm. Um, so it's actually a farm that Growing Home is in the process of transitioning away from because most of the population we work with is in the city and we're trying to develop more within the community. Um, but I believe strongly, and probably I think you would all agree, uh, if we think about it, right, there's no such thing as urban agriculture without rural agriculture, uh, unless you want to stop eating grains and pigs and, you know, like, I mean, it's hard to keep a cow in the city. Um, so, uh, so we have a 10-acre farm that we manage, but 3.5 is in production, and the rural farm serves a CSA. So CSA is community supported agriculture, right? People buy in at the beginning of the season, give you a huge chunk of money when you need it to actually do the work on your farm. And then they forget that they've given you money and they think they get a free box of vegetables every week and they're so excited about that and have all kinds of goodwill. Um, so CSA is a wonderful, wonderful model. In the city, uh, pretty much everything we grow goes to markets and restaurants. We've also done with, some work with women, infants, children, um, some work with Dill Pickle Co-op. But a majority of what we sell goes to markets and a few restaurants. Uh, and we like to work with really like not crazy chefs, so we've actually cut back our restaurants a lot. Because there's a lot of crazy chefs out there. <laughs> oh, they make very good food, but they just yell things about currant tomatoes all the time. Uh, <laughs> So, so most of that is going to be market. So now as we transition away from the rural farm, uh, we're going to be transitioning more toward market, although we're looking at 
eventually establishing community supported agriculture within the city. Uh, part of what we also do is we have a, a farm stand in Englewood every Wednesday so that we sell uh, organic, healthy produce to the community um, at affordable rates. Uh, we, do, we also do like link, we do double the money at the farmer's market. Anything we can do to also get that produce back in the community, the stuff that we take and sell elsewhere is actually goes into supporting the program. Um, so we like to take advantage of people who have a little bit, but it's not really taking advantage because they get beautiful vegetables and they get to feel good about themselves so they can kick puppies all week. And then, and then we, we can sell in the community for low, low costs. And uh, what's awesome is we've actually occasionally, oh, I shouldn't even say that, that's going to make a customer look bad. I'm going to keep that one to myself. Um, so uh, this is an overshot of, uh, of the two farms at Wood Street and the Extension Farm at Honoré. And we're actually looking at, I'm not even going to, wait, is this a laser? Oh my god, I'm like a cat. Uh, we're actually <laughs> looking at um, procuring this piece of land to begin doing some more community development and be able to expand our training program so that everyone's not crowded. Because we don't want to do training for the sake of training. We actually want, it's a transitional job. So people should actually be doing work and taking classes. This was what the Honoré Street Farm uh, looked like in 2011. And this is an inside shot of what the hoop houses look like now. Um, this is a tour group. We don't have those people permanently standing inside the hoop houses because it blocks a lot of light. Um, here are some adorable children playing on farms and all those vegetables. So we try and do uh, things for the community. So we have things like farm stands, open houses. Uh, we actually have University of Illinois who is doing a test plot um, dealing with things that will serve urban farmers on our urban ag site. Get this, I'm doing so many amazing things in my brain. Uh, the Englewood, this is, do you know what's happening? Do you know, am I doing this? Um, I know, right? All right, maybe if, we, maybe if I just hold it right here. No, okay. So, uh, so we try and do things that are outreach for the community. We have farm field days, we are doing classes. Now we're doing classes more toward job training. Um, so there's community garden and cooking. I think it's just gonna go. Um, so also, the city is actually becoming a lot more receptive to the idea of urban farming because it's very sexy right now. Like when we try and do fundraising, if we say anything about a rural farm, people just kind of like hang their heads. And then as soon as we're like, we need another greenhouse in an urban setting, they're like, let us give you money for this. So I think we should all try to take advantage of this a little bit more because it's not going to stay, like nobody stays young and beautiful forever, neither will urban farming. Um, and it's going to be great, and it's going to be there forever, but people aren't going to want to throw as much at it. So we need to kind of you know, get in there and really get people psyched about it while we can build that infrastructure so that we have it forever and ever. Um, yeah, and Rahm Emanuel is even like pretty excited about things. Is anyone from the mayor's office here? No? OK, great. Uh, so he, <laughs> so he, just, he loves to come and speak at our farm and say wonderful things he did. I uh, didn't repeat this. Turn the camera off. Um, but every time he does, he calls and he's like, please don't allow any community members here to speak to me, um, especially when the schools were closing. So we're like, oh, OK. And then he comes and he talks. But usually, he makes something good happen for the community after he does that. So we're like, OK, we'll go along with it. Um, it's weird to have to play politics when you grow vegetables, but these things happen. Um, and I just want to actually share with you one uh, specific story before I wrap up, something that happened this year. Uh, when there was a spate of violence in the south side of Chicago this year, uh, one of our trainees at the time, um, his younger brother was one of the young boys who was killed. And he, you know, so we reached out. We had actually, he had just been placed in a job uh, that week. And so we reached out and we talked to them. And he came in and he told us, you know, everyone keeps coming to me saying, when are we going to retaliate? When are we going to retaliate? And he said, you know, uh, two months ago, that wouldn't have been a question. And he's like, but now I actually have something to lose. Um, so that's what I'm going to say uh, about growing home. That a lot of times, you know, we think about Les Brown starting this and saying we want to give people mm -hmm. roots. But more and more, our trainees have shown that instead of growing roots, they're actually growing wings. Uh, so I encourage you to check us out at growinghomeinc.org. Someone sometimes hacks our website and it goes to porn. I swear we do not run an urban farm porn. So if it goes to that, just let us know. And we'll hook you up to the proper website, I promise. But it's growinghomeinc.org. And thank you guys so much. <laughs> Who wants to ask things? Cool. I clarified everything. <laughs> oh, yes. How did you get into that? 
Um, so uh, I went to school for like theater and religious studies. Um, but, uh, but actually I found, um, when I was teaching, I found some interesting farming programs that sounded kind of cool. And I was like, okay, in five years, if you're still into this, you're going to do it. And then I started working in the alternative schools in Chicago and I would get into all these really interesting conversations about food with my students. And I started realizing I couldn't be an advocate unless I actually knew more about this. Um, so I took a leave and looked at this farming program. I moved to the Middle East because I figured if I could farm where there's no water, uh, then I'll be able to farm anywhere. So I would like periodically sneak into Lebanon to like build gardens and then sneak back out. Uh, it was pretty fun. Um, anyway, uh, I learned a ton, ended up building a lot over there, uh, did some work in Ethiopia during the famine in 2012. Um, I, that continued into projects in Uganda. And so I was doing a lot of dry land agriculture. Um, and then I thought, uh, when I was kind of back here in between trips, I was like, oh, maybe I'll like farm in a place where we can just be really wasty with our water. Because uh, just, it just sounded exciting to be able to use a sprinkler. Um, so I, uh, I did an internship on Uncommon Grounds rooftop. And then through that, I had been following Growing Home for a while. And I saw a job opening. And I told them they should hire me. And they were like, why? And I said, just trust me. And then they did. Uh, so And I've been working there ever since. And they seem to like me now. So. Here, Sally. Yes. yes. Um, so that is a great question. So there are uh, two and a half answers to that. So technically, we have a staff of about 18, a full-time staff. Um, every year for an extended time, we employ several graduates. Um, a lot of times, for various reasons, we have pretty amazing graduates who have difficulty getting jobs. Um, and so either because of background issues that we can't advocate beyond uh, or our partner, a partner can't advocate beyond. And so we employ them to give them um, both because it helps us and to give them longer experience. And usually that turns into a job elsewhere. Um, so that'll be an additional like three to four people every year. And then everyone who's in our transitional program is actually getting paid through that. So it is a job. So they are uh, fully paid. And so during the summer, at any time, we have an additional 20 employees. Um, during any part. Uh, yes, madam, and then Kelly. Yeah. Oh, I love that question. Do our income and expenses equal? The answer is never. That will never happen for us uh, on our model, which is fine because we are purposely designed as a nonprofit. So. Uh, most of the wages for our trainees come in through grants from the city because the city has nowhere near the awesome employment record that we do. So they figure, hey, why don't we like pay you to do this? And so we're able to pay everyone through that. Um, we do private donation. Um, we get some through larger corporations. And then I would say probably our, let me do some quick math, our income totals about uh, all maybe like not quite 20%, probably like 18.7% of uh, what we need to run growing home at this point. But also that's because we haven't put, we're now putting more of a focus on income covering a larger part. We would love it to be at 30%. I think just uh, realistically, like I am the you know daughter of a very OCD human being. So like for me, like I work with numbers a lot and like realistically, it's probably not gonna be above 30% at any point. But I think if we moved into something like value added and made changes like that, that could be a totally different story. And yes, Kim. I just had a quick question. Sure. One of your slides that flipped through really, really fast was yeah. the um, urban agriculture district. Oh yeah. I and I was just wondering if you could talk about that. Do, do, do. Yes. And like if you if you're a part of it. Or... So so yeah, growing home is um, as you can see it says in December of 2005 we were invited. Um, by Teamwork Englewood and several other stakeholders to try and develop to develop this plan. And so the plan is in action. I think realistically, like our outreach director is the person who handles most of that and would be able to speak far more in depth. Um, but it is, it's something that's like constantly in works and also constantly in flux. If you if you go to these areas right now, like you'll see a couple of small starts. You won't, I mean you won't see what this looks like at all, which is very purposeful, right? They make like a magical drawing that looks like the perfect place on Earth. And then everyone like hopes for that for, as you can see, you know, going on 10 years now. But work is actually being done. And there are some amazing um, 
really amazing organizations that are grassroots community activists in Englewood who are making these things happen. And there are a number of organizations who are actually uh, expanding that into other areas. And in fact, some of our graduates and trainees, we put together a graduate board as well so that we constantly have a voice of people who have gone through our program. And some of them are really interested in expanding that to several other neighborhoods where they have connections. Um, but a lot of this is available online. And if anyone is interested, I will give you Sonia's information because she is like the most amazing person to hear talking about this. Um, so that's what I'll say. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. What is the process for selecting the people that you Oh, that's an awesome question. Um, this is going to flip through 10 more slides, so just bear with it. Uh, so we recruitment, actually, we started remodeling about two years ago because we were noticing that we would have um, some people who were incredibly successful in our program and some people who were not necessarily as successful. And we started really trying to think actively about like, how, are, how can we select for the people who, who this is going to serve in the best way. Um, and so we actually, uh, we have a number of relationships with places like um, Heartland, uh, Sunrise House, um, like a number of actually parole officers. We like to call them like the really good parole officers actually who advocate for the people that they're working with. Um, a number of other places throughout the city. Uh, and then we also go out and do different types of recruitment, speaking at different areas. And then we usually get about 100 people who come in. And we usually narrow that down to probably around like 60 or so. And then we uh, invite people to come in to like fill out paperwork and do that, which is actually the first test, right? Because you have to show up. Um, and then a lot of times people will self-select. Or people will even sometimes self-select like in a group. Um, Shanice, who's our employment training manager, was saying she was speaking in a group. And someone, like their first question was just something about like, well, that's not, like, that's not enough pay. And so, so part of it is actually like engaging with that conversation and seeing if like that's the thing somebody meant or that's the thing that they're looking for. And probably it's not a lot of pay. So we're like, well, if that's the thing that you're looking for, here are some places and some resources we can direct you to. This might not be the ideal place because you will be spending, you know, like 14 weeks making approximately 10 bucks an hour. So if you and, and part of that is actually like thinking actively about what you need and what the, is this going to be the right transition for you. Um, so, so through that, then we do our selection process, narrow it down to, uh, and we do it in two steps. So we do it in 20 in the first cohort, 20 in the second cohort, and usually we go with about 23, um, just in case you know somebody like people have childcare issues. People have there are all kinds of things that come up. So we try and make sure that we have like a full cohort to give everyone who we can the experience and give the cohorts the best learning experience. Sweet. Oh yeah, go for it. That is a great question. So I would say, and I'm going to just add on homelessness and background are actually like, or I'm just going to say living situation. I'm not even going to say homelessness because there are all kinds of problematic living situations. So living situations and background can be huge. Um, and we as an organization, like we know that those are issues, but that's not where our strengths lie in solving that. So we do what's called wraparound services. We partner with a number of different organizations. Heartland has actually been huge uh, for a lot of our employees. And also for um, background, CGLA, which is Cabrini Green Legal Aid, which is also having their benefit tonight. And they're amazing, uh, has been a huge help in terms of advocacy. So what we try and do is form relationships and partnerships with organizations whose goals are to do that and do it well, and make sure that everyone who comes through our program is being served by the people who are best capable at serving them for that particular need. Cool. Good. Thank you guys so much. All right. Um, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Brock Leach. Um, Brock is the founder and CEO of Urban Till Corporation. Uh, with a background in quant quantitative logic and continuous improvement, um, Brock founded Urban Till in 2011 with the goal of producing a scalable model of local urban, pr of local urban production. Um, as CEO of the company, he has led uh, the team through several cycles of continuous improvement, focusing on cost control and research and development. The company is currently in its capitalization phase with over 100 customers 
and um, reconvention from Zagat as a top artisan, Urban Till is marching towards his goals. So I met Ur uh, Brock about six months ago. I had the pleasure of meeting him, and I'm um, looking forward to uh, having you here today. Thanks a lot. I think you covered it. So <laughs> See if we can get this thing to work. Oh, there we go. All right, so Urban Till. What is Urban Till? Who are we? In most simple form, we're an indoor hydroponic farm, about 30,000 square feet, located on the far west side of Chicago in the old Sunbeam Bread Factory. It's currently called Sungate Industrial Park now. Um, and, yep, that's about right. Um, and uh, we, uh, like I said, we have uh, over 100 customers. Uh, we've serviced 143 customers in the last four weeks. Um, everybody from Grace and True to Revolution Brewery to Frontier, um, to Keto Kitchen, just to name a few. Um, we've been really well embraced by the culinary community and, and uh, that's been a huge piece. My background um, is in quantitative logic. Um, I've been a uh, kind of number geek my entire life. I can even remember, you know, sitting at home in my bedroom and I would be drawing up business plans and writing up production schedules before I even knew what they were. Um, I took that and, and applied it in the Navy as an intelligence specialist. I then went into the financial markets and then decided, you know, I really don't like the financial markets, so I want to get more practical. So then I got into continuous improvement with Six Sigma and Lean. And that's kind of where I found a home. I ended up landing at a company called Martin Brower. Um, Martin Brower is, distributes over 50% of the food from McDonald's um, worldwide. <coughs> And, and that's kind of actually really the birthplace of Urban Till. Because my job at Martin Brower was continuous improvement in the, their foods, in the McDonald's food supply chain. And as we were rolling newer, healthier uh, menu items out, we had a lot of issues with the, the supply chain. A uh, great example of this actually is with uh, smoothies. So when smoothies rolled out, um, mango flavored smoothies was the number one seller. Um, we went through 80% of all of the available supply that was located in the United States. Now, it might have came from outside the United States, but 80% of the supply. The prices of mangoes skyrocketed. And so the phone rang, hey Brock, go look at this, we need to figure this out. So, um, as we're looking at it, some astonishing um, numbers really popped out of my head. 75% of the mangoes grown on this world fall to the ground unused, uneaten. But we can't get enough mangoes to all the corner McDonald's stores so that we can buy smoothies, right? Um, and so we started looking at what the cost would be to put in the supply chain infrastructure to capture those mangoes. Well, you've got a lot, right? So they're located in an area where you have the, a population that's not educated in industrial agriculture. There's no cold storage because they're, it's not an agricultural location. Um, there's no cold storage uh, shipping lanes even set up. Um, so all that was going to be this huge cost. So we looked at, well, what if we build indoor orchards in the United States and just grow them there? By far the cheapest solution, and that's what they went and did. Well, that really kind of set off this big light in my head. I'm like, wait a minute. Since the beginning of the industrial age, we have moved production further and further away from consumption because of some really basic economic drivers, right? When you have a rural population 
average wage increases, land value increases, right? Your base costs increase, so you push it out and you can lower those and as long as the lowered expenses is more than the cost that you incur to transport it, all good. Like we've literally been cheating inflation for years by moving production, right? If you really think about it, that's what we're doing. We're cheating inflation, right? We're lowering our cost of production by moving the production. Well, you can only go so far. We've moved it from the urban to the rural to the west to overseas across borders. Globalization is starting to take its toll. And when we go to a foreign country, we're starting to create a middle class supporting jobs, right? That middle class needs a support mechanism. So more jobs are created, right? And, and wages increase, land value goes up. That doesn't have to equal where we're at. It just has to come up enough that it offs with the additional cost of transportation offsets the balance. And that's where it has to go. Because all those things we're talking about aren't going to stop. The world's going to continue to have a larger population, right? I mean, land values are going to continue to go up. So production is going to continue to contract now until it becomes right where it started, right next to consumption. So I ask myself, why am I not seeing more urban farms? Why am I not seeing local production more successful? And the answer popped out really quick. I didn't have to dig too deep, right? It's a baby industry. We're at our infancy. Most of the money of it is, I want to use the word novelty, right? Some of the largest hydroponic indoor operations belong to Walt Disney, right? ADM had it and closed it, right? Um, but they were using it mostly for seed propagation towards the end, and that's what they use their current hydroponics for, not to create for produce, but to isolate seed strains and produce, you know, altered seed strains. Um, Nobody was really focused on how do I lower the entry, to, the barrier to entry? How do I control costs? Well, ding, ding. Oh, that's what I do for a living, and I see this huge opportunity. Urban Till's born. So, when I decided to do this, I had to have a reason. The reason's simple. I want to revolutionize the food supply chain. Like, I don't want to let it take its time and get there. I want to revolutionize it. And there's a lot of reasons to fight that fight, right? There's tons of good upside. And yeah, we can make the world more green. We can reduce carbon emissions, right? We can, <clears throat> We can reduce energy dependence. We can provide healthier food um, that's fresher and has more nutritional value. But in the end of the day, I truly believe that you're never going to change the world unless you can make something that makes somebody else money, right? Because it takes money to make money. It takes money to fight a war. Right? If, if it's going to be a revolution, it's going to take a lot of money. And the only way you'll attract the type of dollars that is needed to do something to that scale is to focus on the ability to provide a return to investors that has a better time to return than other investments that they could choose and has a better return than other investments that they could choose. And in the end, 
it's going to be messy. A lot of the things the other speakers have talked about, the regulations are not figured out. I get a health inspection tomorrow. They could choose to grade me based off of uh, kitchen regulations, distribution regulations, or food production regulations. Their choice, right? Because urban farming doesn't fit into any, there's not an urban farming category. You can get an urban farming business license. You can get coded for it. Yeah, you can. I can, I can help you out with that. Because <laughs> um, it's, yeah. <laughs> we'll talk. The innovation one? Huh? Is it innovation? Uh, my lawyer handles most of that, but I know I got one. <laughs> I'm good. So. Let's talk. Yeah. <laughs> the zoning's right now. They finally got that figured out. But, uh, so that's a big problem, right? There's, it's complete, um, what's the word I'm looking for there? It, there's a lot of ambiguity, right? And that could change any day. Um, and, and it takes a lot of work. So as I've said, you know, the why About a year after I got into this, I started, you know, really thinking about what makes certain companies successful in emerging industries. And I started studying, you know, Apple. I started studying Ford. You know, I watched a lot of TED videos, um, and and the one about the why really stuck out. So this is a complete rip off of a TED speech, but and I'll be the first to admit it. Um, but I kind of understood the why, but understanding how the why, the how, and the what kind of fit into each other um, is really huge. Our why is what gets us up in the morning, what makes us passionate about our jobs, right? It's, it's what allows us to put one foot in front of the other. Our how is what's going to make us stand out and what's going to make us successful. And for us, that's perpetual innovation. It's R&D with a focus on cost control over and over and over again. The, the what's just the beautiful byproduct that we get, right? And that is being able to consistently deliver high quality produce, what we call 12 hours fresh, because we cut and deliver in the same day to restaurants, um, 365 days a year. So, but, Urban Till is not about delivering produce to high-end restaurants. You know, a garden, great. You can feed yourself, your neighbors, your community. High-end produce, premium produce, wonderful. Chefs can do some great stuff with it, and it tastes beautiful. Um, but to actually revolutionize the food supply chain and change the world, we've got to be able to produce processes and equipment that's so cost feasible that we can literally grow product locally that is cheaper than what the options are today. So let's take a few seconds and let's think about a different world. What if the world we woke up to um, instead of growing corn over mass amounts of land, taking it into corn silos, storing it, transporting it, dumping it into feed troughs, letting cows eat it when it's not even good for them, it gives them stomach ulcers and all types of health issues, right? It produces a meat that has negative health impacts to us as consumers, we woke up to a world where right next to the feedlot, there was this ginormous 300,000 square foot vertical space that was just growing grass. And that grass literally traveled feet to be consumed. And we could get rid of all the, the carbon emissions associated with all the transportation 
of all of that rain. I mean, literally, think about it. Who here has taken a, a road trip in the last five years from Illinois? And what do you see for hours? Right? That's all getting transported. It's all getting moved. Vast differences. Because you don't see very many what on that road trip? Cows. Cows. Right? Production, consumption, even applies to that. What if um, instead of using artificial sugar or even sugar or even stevia that's being produced in Argentina, we could produce a sweetener using stevia right next to the processing plant that pulled out the ribo A, right? And we could then possibly reduce the need of sugar in multiple product lines because there was a more cost-feasible, healthier product available. That's the world that we're trying to create. And it's going to be a long road because there's a lot of work to do um, on cost efficiencies. Now, part of it, it's really simple math when it comes to making money, right? The typical farmer sees 10 cents on the dollar of the final sale of his good, right? That's it. 75% of the, the dollar actually goes into transportation and distribution and all the middlemen, they're taking their margins on the way up. Because most companies are marking up, they want a 20, 30% margin just for touching, just for making the deal. Right? And so it quickly inflates the price and reduces that percentage that the farmer gets. So our model is actually direct B2B sales. We don't go through other distributors, right? Um, we sell directly to the business. That gives us the ability to capture a lot more of the dollar. And it even gives us the ability to be a lot less efficient from a cost standpoint than a traditional farmer. Even if my expenses are twice as much, I'm getting so much more of the margin that I can still even make, make more money. But it's not that easy. I'd love for it to be that easy. The reason why it's not is because now I have to market. I have to sell. I have to take care of the legal, right? I have to have operational soundness in areas that, the other, that traditional farming gets to pass off. Right? There's an infrastructure in businesses that have tens and twenty and hundreds of years of, of institutional knowledge baked in. Low me typical problems of a startup, right? We actually have to figure out how to be a business. But it's just not a segmented business. Because the model that we're taking, it's much wider. We really do have to have not only the knowledge of how to grow it, but then marketing and sales and communication strategies that have to be top notch to be successful. So to do that, we kind of focus on, you know, the four P's. I'll change them around a little bit, but the first one's product. What do we sell? We've simplified it in the main component of uh, of just doing greenery, right? So we're not doing blooms and anything that blooms or fruits. We do some flowers, but they're all byproducts. They're uh, temperature byproducts or, or late stage of the plant byproduct. Like arugula flowers, towards the end, once we get to that run point, we'll pop the flower, we can sell it. Not intentionally trying to pop arugula flowers. Right, um, but we focus completely on on you know just the grow period. That makes the hydroponics really easy. I don't ever have to switch my nutrient mix. I don't have to switch my light cycle. I can keep everything really standard. Um, we really had to focus on services and what would make us stand out from the, everybody else that's selling produce. Um, we had a lot of things that we could do that nobody else could do. We can provide 12-hour fresh produce. No other produce distributor or even 
you know, a farmer up in Wisconsin is really going to be able to deliver that. Um, that, which allows us to compete on freshness and taste. Um, we went out and we really drove a change in the restaurant culture um, and a change to how the restaurants are actually controlling their cost, right? Versus the traditional method of ordering large quantities to get dis, you know, the lower price break and stretching it out in their cooler we really focus on how much waste are you creating by doing that, right? If you've got 20% waste on your case of cilantro, yeah, you paid, you paid $6 for it, but what you really paid was closer to eight. And then if you take in the labor that you spent on sorting through your product, storing your product, touching your product, you might now be at nine, suddenly, all right, so pay me not, right? And, and that's kind of how we, uh, we focused on our pricing and how we really focused on take smaller orders more frequently, have it super fresh, um, and really changing, changing the needs. And that's what really helps us hit our gross margin numbers is the ability to really upsell off of market price without actually impacting the restaurant's food costs. Um, our main competitive advantages, uh, the first year of Urban Till, we did not sell a single thing. All we did was system re-engineer. So we would buy hydroponic systems off the store, you know, from your grow shops, and we would tear them apart, we'd grow out of them, and we'd say, all right, this isn't needed, this isn't needed, I can build it this way, and I can do it cheaper, and I can scale it this way. And that's all we focused on for an entire year. Um, the next year, we did just a little bit of starting to understand this part and getting it out into the restaurants. The big one right here, and I'll talk about some of this stuff. I can't really get into the nuts and bolts because it's kind of like the criteria information that my investors are really betting on. But uh, we've built out our facility at $26 a square foot, and that's a vertical facility. And so you're getting about 3.2 square feet of grow per square foot of space um, in our facility. Um, the other operations that uh, we've been able to get numbers on, and mostly from the press that they do, um, have spent anywhere from 900 up and upwards. Gotham Farms, the biggest operation in New York, is close to $240 a square foot. Um, and there's, there's operations here in Chicago that are, are at over $100 a square foot on their build out. Um, again, it's about reducing the lower barrier. Do you have that, are you operating? I'm familiar with that facility. Yeah. Do you have that whole facility? No, just 30,000 square feet of it. That's a 2 million square foot oh, facility. Okay. So, yeah, it's, yeah. Right. it's a yeah. huge facility. Yeah. So Maybe it's someday. Chicago or Cicero? It's in Chicago, technically. It's a Chicago side. Yeah. Um, light design, huge improvement. So, light design was huge. Um, that's what really drove the 26 over the 90. Uh, we don't do vertical stacks. Um, your, your lighting infrastructure there is going to just be astronomical. So we have a proprietary A-frame system that allows us to spread out what we call high impact lumens, right? So when we choose our lighting, we choose it more on the distance, how, how much the lumens degrade over distance so that I can spread that light um, over the max area without having to spend additional money on infrastructure. Um, we do other things like harmonic transformation versus magnetic transformation. Um, off scheduled uh, um, hours, right? So um, we uh, do water reclamation off of uh, evaporation um, versus using water. There, a bunch of this stuff we do isn't even necessary for our Chicago operation. We're trying to position ourselves for different climates. So say you go to Vegas, where electricity is cheap, but water is expensive, right? The exact opposite of Chicago, right? Do we, would ha we have the systems in place to operate economically? 
environment like that. So we spent a lot of time on stuff like that. But what I really believe the future of urban agriculture is going to be is in this last category, right? So when you get into indoor urban agriculture, now you're talking about being able to eliminate volatility. Let's think about all the things that are built around our financial system to handle volatility. Uh, the Chicago Board of Trade, right? What is that? That is a financial institution that allows growers and users to hedge their risk of weather and fuel costs and other variables, right? Like Price shows, variability. Like shows so with, uh, if indoor urban agriculture can really be sustained at a price feasible rate, right? You pretty much can eliminate the need for those other things, right? Because you're taking, if you're taking the product off the road, you're taking away the fuel cost and the fuel variability and the energy dependency. If you're getting it indoors, you're getting away from droughts and over rain and, and all of the weather impacts that happen to food costs. So that's what I believe will actually be one of the most attractive things um, and why um, really industrial clients are going to become very interested um, when price barriers start to get broken down in this industry. And that's what we're really focused on long term. And then lastly is our brand strategy. We focus on talking about the food. So if you see me in a press article, if you see me out in a restaurant, um, if you hear about Urban Till, it's almost always focused on the food right now. Um, we really, that's from a public perception, that's what we want to focus on, is how great does it taste, right? How great does it look, and who's using it? Um, and, uh, and we've tried to visually sustain that. The best thing that's happened is our customers perpetuated. They started putting us on their menus without us even asking, right? They started sending us press people um, and I was getting phone calls, hey, hey, I was at Tequila Kitchen and Dave wouldn't shut up about you guys, right? Um, that's how we got the Zagat piece. Um, was straight, just from that reporter had heard about Urban Till in so many different restaurants that we got included on that, despite the fact that she has never talked to a single employee at Urban Till or been to the Urban Till facility, right? Um, so that's uh, it's kind of our competitive advantages. In the end of the day, if, if Urban Till is going to realize what we're aiming to do, um, we, we got to be scalable, right? And scalability really comes down to a, a few things. A, you've got to prove it. You've got to prove your fundamentals. You know, what can you output and what's your cost and what's your margin, right? We've really done a good job of that, substantiating the data, getting it in concrete. Um, we're right now working on going, we started with 3,000 square feet of grow. We're building out into 30,000. That's a very delicate balance though, right? Because the problem with growth, and especially in agriculture, is you gotta run upside down as soon as you decide to expand. Right? So if I'm at 3,000 feet, I can make great margins. But if I want to go to six or nine, not only do I have to put in the capital infrastructure, I then need to go plant a lot of plants. Because right now, today, just to maintain our current sales, we plant 40,000 plants a day. Right? Between herbs and lettuce. And that doesn't even include our micro operation. That would be kind of cheating if I counted all of those as individual plants. But um, yeah, 40,000 plants. That's not a day, that's a week. It's a week, <laughs> let me uh, clarify. Uh, 40,000 a week though. 40,000 plants a week that we're doing. And really right now we're only at about 12,000 square feet is actual productive growth. And so, 
It's a balancing act because I can't just go build out that full 30 because I'll either have burned through so much cash so quick that then I'm gonna have a bunch of plants. My sales team won't be able to catch up in time. Um, and I'll burn through cash while I'm waiting because I'll have additional overhead and expenses. So it's, it's a really delicate balance because on the other side of it, the sales team's out there doing a great job, but if you don't keep on growing your, your production square feet, suddenly you're telling people that, hey, I'm sold out. And then that can have negative connotations. It's probably one of the hardest balances that we've had is, is how to do, do um, controlled growth um, in a high demand um, environment uh, without burning so much cash that you end up running yourself into the ground. Um, but once that 30,000 square feet is completely built out, um, we'll have spent just a little bit over a million dollars just on the build out and, uh, and, and the costs associated with that build out. Um, but that 30,000 square feet based off of our current yields and, and margins um, will produce about $4.5 million gross and about a 40% net margin. Sounds great, right? Um, but there's a lot of reality that goes along with that. And the reality is that you have to have a top-notch team with outstanding business practices. You have to provide a superior product, superior service, at a superior value. Not only for the high-end restaurants, but to do any of this other stuff, it's going to have to be the best, and it's going to have to be cheaper than it is today. Right? It's got to be a better product at a better price. And uh, it's a lot of long hours, it's a lot of blood, it's a lot of sweat, it's really, literally blood, um, every once in a while. Um, and, uh, and, and it can, uh, you know, my cash management, uh, what I've learned about cash flow management and analysis in the last two years, it actually in the last three months even blows my mind. That the skills that that we're having to pick up and develop as the business, you know, went from something that, you know, had a few hundred thousand dollars in it to something that, you know, is in the million plus range now. Um, in such a, you know, late, like, in December, January 1st, we had 15 customers, right? I mean, that's how quickly it, it's moving now. And that rapid growth, um, has, has just really demonstrated to me, you know, the need for, you know, financial acumen at a level that I don't even have, right? And, and for legal acumen and, you know, because now I'm dealing with very sophisticated investors, you know, right? Versus just kind of friends and family at the beginning. Um, there's just so many layers to a rapid growth business and, and to the whole entrepreneurial thing that if I really want to see this succeed, that, you know, I know it's going to be long and know it's going to be bloody and I know I've got to do these things. And I, I would love to sit here and to say, you know, sustainability is it going to be a really easy road because it's the right thing to do and we can all go do it yet. It's going to be really, really hard. Um, to really make that impact and really change the world. But I truly believe that we that it, it's worth um, every single cent and every single uh, drop of sweat. Um, and I'm excited to get back to work tomorrow. But thank you guys for your time. All right. Any questions? Any thoughts on moving to aquaponics? So, um, I am personally not a fan. Um, I really believe in finding something that you can do well and simplifying it as much as possible. And I believe aquaponics um, complicates the situation in a few different ways, right? Now I've got a very diverse product line. 
um, that I'm trying to, that I need to sell. Um, I've got that many more skill sets that my team needs to have. Um, I've actually got from a product handling standpoint, the fish, the produce, right? And it, it, it just complicates it for me and I'm a really big believer in taking pieces out of the puzzle versus putting pieces in. So for me, I think I, I'm increasing my likelihood of success by focusing more on hydroponics of greenery and kind of building, once got that nailed down and I've done that, then let's go do some other stuff. But yeah. I think it's great for other people, it's just not for me. Sir? You spoke of, uh, you had a financial background. Did you ever trade commodities? Yes, I did. I was a CTA. Oh, CTA? Yeah. I had a series three, I was a CTA. I basically was a algorithmic trader. Right. Um, yeah, that's, I did that for a while. Did you research the energy consumption and the environmental impact of this form of production versus traditional? So um, we've been really lucky. We've had a few interns come through our space. One of them is actually from the University of Chicago, Ryan Hoyt. Um, he was with the public policy uh, department or degree program, however that um, is to be said. And he actually focused a little bit of his time on those things. We've got some base numbers um, from a water consumption standpoint. Um, with our reclamation, we actually are water positive, meaning that we pull no water from the ground. Now, I'll be honest, that's really a trick or a gimmick per se, because I'm using electricity to do that, okay? But I'm doing that because if I can generate electricity in the desert, but still be water positive, then that opens my viability. I, I shouldn't be doing that in Chicago because water's cheap, right? Um, even without it, there's plenty of data out there that shows that your water usage is much lower with high, closed system hydroponics than with open um, space irrigation, right? Um, did that answer your question? What about energy? Energy is something that we've done. It, it's mind blowing. Um, from traditional hydroponics, we actually have been able to reduce our consumption level by 80%. Um, some of that is with stuff that we have patents pending on, um, harmonic electrical uh, transference. That's where you downgrade from like 440 to 220, but you don't do it over big spiels, right? Um, you, you use a different methodology that actually allows that energy to be uh, um, transformed without shedding um, and having loss as much as uh, normally happens with normal transformers. Those things get really hot, right? That's the energy just dollar bills flying out. Um, so we try to keep those together. Um, I don't know about that. Um, My wife would probably argue about, with you. I was, I was just curious, um, I don't know if you want to share this, but how much money um, did you raise? Um, and then when did you go after like the big time investors after you first started? You started in 2011. Um, maybe you not sure. Um, you know, so I took a very, and I'll tell you, if I were to do it again, I would do it differently. I'll be really, really honest with you. I took an approach they said, all right, I'm going to do this whole thing in phases. So the first amount of money, the first money that went into Urban Tills was my and my, my wife's, right? That, that was the first amount of money that went into Urban Till. After that, we did it in very small chunks, and it was goal-oriented. I'm going to raise $50,000 to take me from proof of concept on my equipment to the first five customers. Right, and then it was I'm gonna raise a hundred thousand to take me from and double my production facility and go from you know a thousand square feet to five thousand square feet and go from five customers to fifteen. Right, and then it was all right. Now I need to get scalable, so I need to automate systems. 
right? And so I needed so much money to do that to, before I could go even bigger than that. And so every time it was about lowering the risk for the next investor so I could literally get more for the money out of them. So that's why as I did the increments, the raises went up, but so was the value that we were retaining with the raise, right? So, and the reason that I tell you that we do it completely different is because you're dealing with tons and tons of investors. Your investors are changing in sophistication. Um, it just makes it very um, complicated. Um, if I were to do it again, I would have kept it really small and I would have went after one large sum, even if it would have cost me um, more points. But everything happens for a reason. Yeah, everything does happen for a reason, but it, it was, it, it, and the main reason is because we actually extended our burn the way that I did, right? Because if I would have raised the full amount for the full build out from the very beginning, and then planned on that and brought in an aggressive sales team, if I would have known what I know today, right? Ha, ha, ha. But that's the reality of it is most entrepreneurs are learning as they go and they're all making some of the same mistakes. That's why serial entrepreneurs, even when there are failures, it's easier for them to raise money the next time around, right? It's because the, the real investors out there, the serious money people, know, you know that entrepreneurs make the same mistakes, right? First time entrepreneurs make the same mistakes. The second time entrepreneurs just have it so much easier in the fundraising world because they've already learned some of those hard lessons. So I didn't answer your question in entirety, but hopefully gave you something of value. Yes, ma'am. We have two questions. First is, um, how, much, how many staff people do you employ to manage all those tens of thousands of plants? And second of all, where do you hire your people? All right. So um, we currently employ 24 people at Urban Till. Those are all full-time employees. Out of that, we carry a much higher management ratio than is actually necessary um, because we're planning for expansion and scalability, right? So we're carrying along some people and, and, and more layers on the management side than would be necessary for the level of sales that we're doing today. But that's because someday I want to build Urban Till Vegas and Urban Till Miami, and then I want to go do, you know, Project Grass, right? And I want to go do Project Stevia. So I'm trying to keep institutional knowledge and build institutional knowledge with my team. So I carry about uh, eight managers or supervisors out of the 23. So ridiculous high ratio. Um, those people pretty much came from my previous experiences um, in other companies, right? So people that I knew of through, through my past. Um, and then our farm hands and delivery drivers, we pretty much get off of Craigslist. Um, it's Craigslist post and bring them in, interview them, and get them to work. Very diverse workforce too, which I really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, that's where we get them from. Is, and, and to be honest, it's, it's a really simple job, right? I mean, it's, and, and the great thing is how much passion people can get for it. And, and, and we really embed the continuous improvement all the way down to the front line, because that's the only way continuous improvement really works, right? It's, it's, uh, it's called Gimba um, and, and the lean um, sector, and that means go see. And that means that you'll never be able to prove anything unless you're actually in it, your hands are dirty, and, and, and it goes one step further to say, um, it's the person's hands that have been dirty the longest that's gonna be able to help you the most, right? So um, we have a three-step process. We don't try to teach everybody all the fancy, smancy stuff. It's really easy. Um, three steps. Ask a question, take a risk, learn a lesson. That's what we ask every employee to do every single day, right? And uh, we get a lot of engagement that way out of that team.
So Ryan actually came to us through uh, one of our board members um, uh, who actually um, started his career working for me as an intern um, when I was a CTA. Um, but uh, Ryan came to us uh, and uh, he really came in on uh, and, and focused in on helping us navigate some of the bigger picture stuff down the road, right? So let's say we actually grow grass cheaper than corn and we can deliver it and this whole like crazy idea works. Um, what type of target are we gonna have on our back? And what strategies could we use to mitigate that, right? And so he really helped develop some white papers. Our interns, I really let them kind of shape their projects as long as we get something of value and they're getting something of value, then so that was the type of stuff that he ended up working on. Um, so yeah, it was a little bit of a friend of a friend type is how we got there, but he kind of got his, in shape his own stuff. So then you have other nutritionists or similar types of- Yeah, nutritionist intern that's coming through and looking at nutrition values over a time uh, lapse, right? So. What's the nutrition value of a bunch of a uh, bunch of a cilantro that's a week old that's traveled from Mexico versus uh, our cilantro, which is being consumed um, within 12 hours of being cut? Um, so that was a, a project that intern picked out. Um, yeah, different interns doing different stuff. It sounds like this is more like your R&D division. Of Absolutely. My in interns are the R and D division. That is absolutely correct. We got time for one more. Anybody? <laughs> so you're you're a disruptor. You mentioned you have a target on your back. Are you able to share with us um, who are the threats out there? Just who would be, you know threatened by your your growth, and, and uh, that might apply to the other farms as well. I mean, uh, is this is this uh, threatening to some key powerful players? The, the number one threat to us right now is unintentionally local government, right? Because they could unintentionally make a decision any day on local or state level that could shut me down without them even knowing that they were shutting me down, mm -hmm. right? That's the number one risk um, that I have to mitigate. And the only way I can mitigate that is with engagement. So we actually, um, you know, we're actually more plugged in. It was easier for us to get plugged in on the federal side of what's going on than it is to get plugged into the local side of what's going on. Um, which, that actually like blows my mind, but that's the reality. Right? You've got to follow the rules that they have now, even though the rules weren't really set up for you. And, and there's a lot of gray there that you got to just kind of tiptoe your way through. And I mean, in some of it, quite frankly, it's just BS too. Right? I mean, a building permit that takes literally 10 months because the project manager went on leave and it didn't get transferred over. Uh, I forget her name. It's a her. I should know this off the top of my tongue, but I don't. I'm not recalling it. I can Google it. If you would have gone on the other side of if you would have been on, on the other side of Roosevelt Road in Cicero, you probably would have had an easier time. I probably would have, but here's the thing. When I decided to launch Urban Till, I was in Miami at the um at the Martin Brower uh, McDonald's um, distribution facility. And I had just um, gotten, and I was reading an internal piece actually on uh, blueberries, because they launched blueberry oatmeal, and they launched it with fresh blueberries. 
and they couldn't get them through the supply chain quick enough, right? So they were purchasing these blueberries and they were coming through and by the time that they were getting to the stores, there was only two days of shelf life. Well, here's the trick. McDonald's are on twice a week deliveries, right? So the blueberries are going bad before the next load showing up. Well, I had just done the smoothie thing and I'm reading this and I'm like, they need a blueberry farm by every distribution center. Oops. That's the only way to do it. They had to go to frozen blueberries. So it, it completely changed and they ended up pulling it from the menu. But that same day, I read this wonderful piece, either in Crane, actually it was in the USA Today, about Ron Emanuel and how he was going to support urban agriculture. And he has done some things, um, but that was one of the reasons I decided, you know, I'm going to do this actually in Chicago. And also for branding reasons. But yeah, it could have been easier if I would have been right across the street. And there's actually some great real estate there, yeah, too. Yeah, I know, the, uh, I know that area as well. Yeah. I grew up not that far from there. Yeah. All right. I think I've ran out of time. Yeah, that's great. Getting kicked out. <laughs> All right. Well, that was fantastic. Um, I'd just like to thank again Angela, Stephanie, and Brock. Uh, can we just real quick thank you for coming?